here we go. We are here today to talk about certainty. So let's do that. What my plan for today is to go for roughly an hour and 20 minutes, if you can deal with that, and we'll talk about certainty. We will stretch our legs and then we will talk about intention after that. I really hope I put the slide packs up in the right order. I don't think it matters. Um, if you are listening to me on a recording and you are not in the room, it's too late if you're in the room, uh, you might like to think about the most efficient use of your time and it might be better to listen to the desk recordings first. On the whole, they tend to be a little less annoying as recordings because I'm just talking to you as opposed to moving around the room and getting distracted. Um, when you have done that and you've done the reading and done everything else, that will probably be enough. But if you're worried, come back and just listen to me. Why not? So, certainty. Topic five. We are now on the home straight to understand what the contents of a contract are. So, chapter six in the readings. Um, basically, what we have already when we understand what the contents of a contract, sorry, what the formation of a contract requires is we know that we need to have agreement made up usually of an offer that contains what I like to call the DNA of the deal. It contains everything that we need so that when somebody accepts it, assuming it hasn't already been withdrawn at the time of acceptance, we have a legally enforceable agreement. So if an acceptance is unconditional, we need to know in order for a contract to be enforceable that it has sufficient certainty. So the offer itself will usually encompass that certainty or the kind of arduous combination of an invitation to treat that is accompanied by terms that is then turned into an offer by somebody making an application or an offer to do something in accordance with the offered terms or the, the invited terms that is then matched by the inviter making the acceptance. So certainty means the parties need to res uh, set out their respective obligations and completeness requires that agreement must contain all of the essential terms. So there are three elements to what it means to be certain. So we need to actually, we need, certainty includes certainty. I know that's circular, but that's the language we tend to use. In order to be certain, uh, in order to demonstrate certainty, we need to be certain as to what the terms are. So another word there might be clarity. The terms themselves need to be complete, It's the next element. So we need to be certain as to all of the important terms or the fundamental terms. And nothing that is important to the deal can be left out because otherwise we've got a, the DNA of the deal is, is missing something. And then we need the terms to be not illusory. We did talk a little bit about what it meant for or what an illusory term was when we were discussing consideration last week. And it will not surprise you that this idea of a term needing to be not illusory is actually closely linked with the idea of consideration. So I know I'm wandering all over the place, but that light is right in my eyes. I think I might just head over here. So basically contract problem solving, we keep coming back to this. We've been looking at it all the way. Um, and ultimately today, as we do these two topics, we're going, to cop uh, we're going to complete it. And we're doing that so we can identify whether or not we ca there is a contract that can be sued on. Subsequently, as you work through contract problem solving, once you know whether there's a contract or not, the next question you'll be asking yourself is who can sue on the, pro on the contract? Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to privity. Um, we do touch from time to time on this issue of if, even if there is no contract, is there another way to enforce a promise? Um, and so we keep touching on estoppel in particular. We will go a little bit deeper when we get to the contents of a contract section into misrepresentation and some statutory um, provisions. Um, but on the whole, estoppel is something that you deal with in advanced. Um, and then 
we look at as a problem solving tool what the party's specific rights and obligations are. So when we talk about specific rights and obligations, they tend to come from the contract itself, but they might come from statute. So, case and material, what have I said here? The cases reflect the tension between, on the one hand, the desire to hold parties to their bargains in accordance with this idea, this immoral idea that if you enter into a contract or an agreement, you should keep your promise. And on the other hand, a court's reluctance to make a bargain up. So we'll see this as we look at certainty. We will also see it as a recurring theme when we look at the contents of a contract um, uh, topics towards the end of the semester, when we're looking at what the terms of the contracts are. Because ultimately, similarly to um, Kirby's discussion in Woolworths that we spent some time on last week, um, or that you, we didn't actually flew past it to be quite frank, but in the classes, but you will have spent some time reading that case. It is not the role of the courts to make commercial bargains. Um, and courts are not well equipped to do so. So there is a reluctance to fill in the gaps unless they absolutely have to. So um, again, just reminding you here that this, these sections we're talking about today are the end of our quadrant of issues of looking at whether a contract has in fact been formed. So, three elements, I started with them, but I think it's really important to remember that when we talk about certainty, we're talking about these three ideas. Is it sufficiently certain or sufficiently clear as to what the terms are? Are the terms themselves sufficiently complete? Is there something missing that might render the document, or sorry, the agreement itself uncertain? And are the promises not illusory? Bit of a double negative there. But they need to, if they are illusory promises, then we fail for two, ultimately we fail for lack of consideration, but it can also fail, it fails for lack of certainty. So, let's unpack them one by one. Um, actually, before we do that, let's actually make one really important statement. It is not necessary for the parties to provide for every possible outcome in an agreement. An agreement will still be certain even if there's down the track, something happens that the parties didn't contemplate. Now, often that is the job of contract makers like myself, is to be a professional wet blanket, to think of all of the things that might go wrong with a view to working out, well, what will the rules of our game be if these things happen? But even if a professional wet blanket hasn't dripped their soggy negativity all over your commercial deal before you started, that doesn't mean that your contract or your agreement will not be sufficiently complete. If the fundamental terms are all addressed, as long as there is nothing missing without which you wouldn't have a deal, we can still have a complete contract, even if it's completely silent as to what will happen if some kind of statement you made about the way that something worked isn't kept or doesn't turns out not to be true. Or even if the day before you're about to take ownership of the yacht, there's a massive storm, the yacht gets wrecked and nothing in the agreement said what, um, who, who was responsible for insuring it. An oddly specific example, but <laughs> bizarrely, one came to mind. Um, so courts will resolve ambiguities and fill gaps to a, an extent, but they won't create terms that weren't thought through. So in, interp in the interpretation of a contract, the maxim that is applied, and my Latin pronunciation is terrible, which is great because I hate it when people correct your Latin pronunciation because it's a dead language. How do they know? Um, but anyway, ut re majus valiat quam parat. 
It's better for a thing to have effect than to be found void. And that, my friends, is a really important idea to remember. That going into a court with an argument that this agreement shouldn't stand up because it's uncertain, actually a hard argument to fly because if it looks like a contract, smells like a contract, the parties have acted on the basis that they've reached an agreement and intention is bound in here as well, then the courts are more likely to find an agreement than not. So this is a difficult argument to win usually if you're trying to argue that there is no con contract for a lack of certainty it's actually a difficult argument to win. Okay, so nice little overview slide. I like a picture that tells us where we're going. I hope you do too. We're going to address these three ideas one by one. Whether or not we've got a complete agreement, whether or not it's vague or, uh, or ambiguous or does it meet the test of not being, of being sufficiently certain, sufficiently clear? And then lastly, we'll talk about the illusoriness or the, the risk of uh, a promise being illusory. It's not enough, as I was just saying a second ago, it is not enough, um, well, these are hard to win. If you're going in and arguing that there is no contract, particularly when the party's clearly intended for there to be a contract, that's all right. Um, it's a hard argument to win. Um, and even if you do win, it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole contract is out. The courts will look at this term by term. So we need to actually ask ourselves the question, can, can the agreement exist without that certainty, uh, without that problematic provision or particularly in relation to the illusory terms. Also, if you have some right or some provision that is um, creating, Im negatively impacting the certainty, can that actually be waived? Can it be excised out of the contract? Um, so, you can see how I've set it up. We are going to start with completeness. So the terms need to be complete, which actually can be summed up in that one sentence below. All essential terms need to be addressed. So again, I'm just going to keep repeating this slide. I clearly had no imagination the day I was putting these slides together. So this is where we're starting. We're on completeness. So some people would argue that completion itself isn't really even a formation um, element. Um, if we don't, if we're in the situation where a contract uh, or an agreement is purportedly uncertain because um, we don't know what it is that the parties agreed, it might be that we didn't have an offer in the first place, that we didn't have something that we could actually, if you remember that definition, there's an American one, the guy's name is Homer, someone I can't remember, I just remember because I always want to call it, say Homer Simpson's definition. Um, that, that American definition, which resonates quite well with me, an offer is something that a person knows if they accept it, that they will be bound by the agreement and that they will have rights. Uh, and so another argument could be if a, if a contract, if it's too uncertain or so incomplete that we don't actually know what the promises were, then maybe we didn't really have an offer in the first place. They're interlocking sort of concepts. So the completeness here means that the parties have set out all the essential um, elements of their agreement or they've got some way of working out what they are. So a contract will be enforced if the party's intentions are clear or you can work out what the party's uh, intentions were with relative certainty. So let me expand on that a little bit. So Hall and Bust is our authority for this question of when a contract will fall apart because it omits an essential term uh, and the court isn't in a position to fill that term in. But having said that, the courts will also look 
to whether or not there is meaning that can be found. So if there is a sensible meaning that can be found, the courts will found, find that. They will err towards finding a contract if it looks like a contract. So let's use Whitlock and Brew as an example here. Um, there are some terms that it can be very difficult to understand what they mean. So what is reasonable, what is fair, will depend on a whole lot of things. What I think is reasonable or fair might be completely different from what Billy thinks is reasonable or fair, or what Scott Morrison thinks is reasonable or fair, or what Bill Shorten thinks is reasonable or fair. Both, uh, you know, using politicians as an example, can use the same words and let's give them the benefit of the doubt, absolutely believe that they are saying that this is right or this is fair, but they're saying absolutely opposite things. So if we have a term in a contract that says you must act reasonably or you must decide fairly, understanding what that means can be very, very difficult in, uh, themselves, uh, uh, a, a very, very difficult concept. So this is one of the reasons for this certainty idea as well, that judges won't all even agree amongst themselves as to what is reasonable or fair in a situation. So the clearer a contract is, the more certain a contract is. So in this particular, in Whitlock and Brew, <laughs> Brew, um, I'm always going to stumble over the word Brew in this name for reasons I won't bore you with. Whitlock and Brew, the, um, the contract included, so it was a written contract in relation to a property, included this clause. The property is sold on the condition that the purchaser would grant a lease of part of the land on such reasonable terms as co commonly govern such a lease. So the question became, was there a contractual requirement for the, under this, the, the sale and purchase agreement, to lease back to Shell, and in that case it was, um, it's, it's basically a storage of petrol tankers. Um, I think it's the lands out near Altona. You might have seen those big, um, uh, it's actually probably the back of Newport, Williamstown, if you're going under the bridge and across in the inner west there, you can see those big tankers. It was that land from memory. Um, I could have mixed it up with another case that's actually cited in it. But effectively what they had to do was, in the agreement, they promised to lease it back on reasonable terms. But what is a reasonable or fair term for what is actually quite an unusual lease? It's not like leasing a house in the suburbs where the Real Estate Institute and the Law Institute provide standard terms. It's pretty easy to work out what ordinary terms would be and you've got many properties that are being leased every month you can get a sense of what a market rent might be this is a piece of industrial land that's going to need to be cleaned up afterwards in fact the cleanup provisions in 1968 would have been quite different from the cleanup provisions that would apply now but this is is it a long-term lease is it a short-term lease what can we do so in that case it was held that the expression upon such reasonable terms as commonly govern the lease wasn't in the context in that it appears in this case um, apt to refer to either the period of the lease or the rent payable. This is not a standard vanilla lease. You can't just guess what a reasonable period of time for the lease would be. You cannot guess what it is or just get from market sources what the rent would be. Justice Kiddo said a reference to reasonable terms would have been sufficiently certain had there been a set of terms in common use. But there was no evidence to support that. So in this particular case, we have a contract that was void for uncertainty, or at least a term that is void for uncertainty. We don't know what reasonable terms are, much less what commonly governs such a lease. There is no common governance of such a lease. 
So the next part of understanding that though is to work out, well, if it's only the essential terms that need to be sufficiently clear, what's an essential term? Anybody want to hazard a guess at what might an essential term be? Parties, time, price, you've looked at the slides at least, <laughs> possibly even more. Um, exactly. So, in fact, it's sitting here right on the slide. You're looking at the slide that's in front of you. Um, parties will almost always be an essential term. Um, pretty much the only time that parties, both parties will not be an essential term is in a deed that is creating a benefit for some future uh, group. So, for example, a deed that establishes a superannuation fund. Uh, there will be a set law for the deed, there will be a trustee, those parties will need to be known, but the beneficiaries of the superannuation fund will be beneficiaries today and future beneficiaries who join, who meet the requirements of a class. But on the whole, we need to know who the parties to an agreement are and it needs to be clear who they are. We can't mess around with them. Why is that? Why do we care who the parties are so much? Yeah, we need to know who can be sued, who can sue on the agreement, um, and also who has the obligations. Um, it's one thing to have an obligation, but we need an obligation and a person who has that obligation. And similarly, it's one thing to have a right, but we need to know who has the right. The subject matter of the agreement. Again, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If I'm selling you some land, a contract that just refers to the word some land is clearly not really going to be helpful to you. We might agree everything else, you know, the settlement date, the price and all the rest of it, but you want to know what piece of land, right? So I, th I think that kind of goes without saying. And price. But why do we need to know price, quote unquote? It's consideration, isn't it? So again, I've got price there because sometimes we don't know the exact price, but we need to know a way to work it out. But we need consideration. Will? Yes, I've got a question. Is that why we have heads of terms at the beginning of contracts to sort of articulate party subject matter and consideration? So if you've seen an agreement, you often have a section at the beginning. So heads of terms or heads of agreement, something like that, is often a, a form of preliminary agreement. So I'm going to put that to one side for a second but often you'll have at the very beginning of an agreement a section that might that it often says background in a modern agreement it'll say background yet almost universally everybody refers to them as recitals um, there is some really vigorous academic debate about whether the recitals or the background section of an agreement is meant to be binding or not. Um, often what you'll do if you look at an agreement, and I suggest that all of you do this at some point, um, you'll have to for your second assignment anyway, you'll have a look in the Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents and have a look at some contracts and you'll see most of them start with that background then they will have, they'll set out some the store, a story effectively, four or five points, and then often it'll say operative terms. And so under the operative terms sections are the, the, the provisions that people expect to be operative. The job of the recitals is usually to tell the story of, the, of an, an agreement. Um, my boss, when I was a very junior lawyer and we used to work in paper all of the time, used to call the recitals the filing cabinet test so that when you were going through the filing cabinet and looking at an agreement, you could just look and read the, that what was on the first page. You didn't want it to go over. So you knew what the agreement was about so you could go either pick it up or go. And it's actually, as a drafting tool, it's not a bad thing. That's what recitals are there. They're to say what the agreement's about, what, what the point of it is. Because let me tell you, the point of an agreement can get lost in the small print very, very easily. Um, but yeah, often making it clear that that's what it is. And that's usually the kind of context where we have a dispute as to whether or not the recitals were meant to be there or not, because the recitals often help us understand what the agreement was about. And if you took them out, would you still understand the agreement the same way? 
Sadly, sometimes if it's badly drafted, no, you might not, but it can provide clarity. So I'm a big fan of making everything part of the agreement myself. Um, so the question I want to look at here is whether a particular absent term or missing term is essential um, will depend on the nature of the contract and the circumstances of the case. So, essential terms, we started this, party, subject matter, price, time periods are often there as well. So, the term or a promise, if a term or a promise is of such importance that a party would not have gone ahead with this deal unless they received that promise, then Tramways and Lunar Park tells us then it's an essential term. will not surprise you at this stage to realise that we work that out objectively. So is an objective test, would, would the vendor, would the purchaser, would the employee, would the employer, would the lessee, would the lessor have signed this agreement if that term wasn't in there? That's effectively our test. Some examples, um, again, it depends on the context. So in a lease agreement, the first day that you get unencumbered access to the property that you are leasing, the commencement date, the amount of rent that you are going to pay or you are going to receive, likely to be essential terms. Um, sale of land agreement, parties, land, price, always essential. Um, settlement date might not be, might be a target date. Um, sale of goods, or the goods themselves. However, if the goods are generic in nature, um, so it might be a bushel of apples, isn't necessarily the same as the apples that you're standing in front of when you're making the deal. Um, a contain a load of iron ore, it might not be the iron ore that you see stockpiled at the mine as long as it is iron ore of the same quality. Um, sale of goods price may not necessarily be a um, specific price, might not be an, es uh, an essential term because the Sale of Goods Act in Victoria provides a mechanism for working out what the price is. So if you have goods that have a market price, you can work out what that price is. So, Bill and Attorney General of Tasmania, 1956 case, isn't it nice? Some of our cases are getting a bit more modern. Um, this is a full court of the High Court decision and it referred to some documents where the plaintiff alleged that there were relevant terms and said, Apart from the fact that the general purport of the communications in questions evidence anything but an attention to affect legal relations. So let's stop there for a second. The court is saying, actually, these documents over here, they're just documents. There's nothing in these documents that suggests to us that there's an intention. So again, we, we're looking at all of the formation elements. The documents only deal with some of the terms which must of necessity be settled before a binding contract can exist. So in order for there to be a binding contract, we need to see that the essential terms have been addressed. No contract is concluded until the parties negotiating are agreed upon their terms of the bargain, unless the terms left outstanding are such as the law will supply. Now in commercial agreements, this is really important. An expression a lot of commercial lawyers use, well, it's not done till it's all done. So in any commercial negotiation, and in fact, our colleagues who may be listening now who are at, in negotiation and dispute resolution or whatever, I think you just negotiate how to resolve disputes there. I wish you were negotiating like buying and selling things. It's much more interesting. But anyway, they're not here to know that I've said that, right? Um, it's not done till it's all done. You are giving you're often making promises, you're saying, if you do this, I will do that. 
I will increase the price if we can get a shorter time period. I will give you a shorter time period uh, to do this in if you, um, you know, I'm going to decrease the price if you're going to um, only provide me with that asset for such a short period of time. I'll pay you more for a longer period of time. I'll pay you more for a higher quality. I will pay you more or less up front and if you give me a longer period to pay, something like that. Um, so um, in a negotiation, you're always giving and taking. Providing the court with evidence of the negotiations, firstly, will lack intention, which we'll talk about. But again, until the parties have concluded all of the essential terms, we don't necessarily have a clear agreement. So how do we work out what to do if a contract is incomplete? Again, the cases, and I don't um, intend to go through each of them one by one, uh, but each of them help us with a different kind of problem. So how important is the missing term? So if a missing term isn't an essential term, then we probably don't have a completeness problem. You might have an agreement that you're not happy with, you might not like the terms, but you probably have an agreement. Um, it's also worth, um, May and Butcher and the King is a good example here, but ANZ Banking will also help you with this one. Um, asking yourself why the term was left out. If the term was left out because the parties couldn't reach agreement in relation to the term, then that suggests that the contract is not incomplete without the term. So, for example, if the dispute is over, well, what will happen if the crops fail? Who will be responsible for ensuring against crop failure um, when there's a forward contract to sell apples? Ultimately, if the contract doesn't deal with that because the parties couldn't agree, I'm saying you need to ensure, you're saying no, I need to ensure. We don't agree so we leave it silent. Clearly we haven't reached agreement on that term. So it's not incomplete because it's missing. Um, courts will also look at whether or not a party has actually performed the agreement or not. And if one party has actually done what they said they would do, it is much, much less likely that a court will find that there is no agreement for lack of completeness. Um, and then they will also ask, and this is the Milne and Attorney General test that we were just looking at before, how equipped is the court to imply a term to fill the gap? Something we will come back to with implied terms. But on the whole, the, co uh, the court is doesn't want to fill in gaps. If it looks like a contract, smells like a contract, it would rather find a contract than not, but it will not put commercial terms in, where, particularly when the parties haven't been able to agree them themselves. It will need evidence of what's reasonable or what the terms are. Okay, so what happens if we get a formula so, for example, the rent is $100 a week to increase every year based on CPI, Consumer Price Index. Let's say it's a good definition of CPI. It actually says, you know, Victoria, you know, capital cities, Australian capital cities, grocery basket or something. CPI means different things in different circumstances. A court is likely to find that that is certain. So we have a base price and we have a clear formula. Formula might even say if CPI goes down, the rent stays the same. Again, that's fine. We have a basis for working out what it is. An option to renew a lease at reasonable rental. Again, we've already seen, if we can work out what reasonable rental means by looking at like comparisons, it's probably going to be okay. But if we're talking about a bespoke piece of property, like an airline hangar, a 
coal mine, a, um, a place where you store fuel, um, I don't know, a heritage building perhaps in a remote, lo remote location, may be less likely to work out what um, reasonable rental would be where you've got nothing much to compare it with. So the validity of the contract itself will depend on whether the court finds a formula or a standard itself as being sufficiently certain. So even if the price or otherwise isn't certain, or even the identification, say, of a beneficiary. As long as you've got a process by finding out whether or that's clear for putting somebody into that box, you're okay. But if the mechanism or the machinery, the formula itself fails to supply the essential term, then the contract itself may be void. Mentioned this before, the Goods Act provides a mechanism for working out what the price is if we have in relation to the supply of goods um, a failure to provide a price. Uh, so section 14. Okay, let me ask you this one. What about an agreement to negotiate? Let me give you a context. Um, I often work with large scale IT project agreements. So somebody's going to build some software to do something for somebody else. And at times along the way, sometimes things go slower than expected or there are changes and you will have a disputes resolution clause. And it's quite often to see something proposed like, if we have a dispute, then um, the project managers will get together and negotiate in good faith to resolve the dispute. But if they can't resolve it in seven days, then it'll be escalated to the CEOs of both companies um, who need to negotiate in good faith uh, to come up with, a, with an answer. Um, and if they can't come up with an answer, then it needs to go to mediation, something like that. Is that a useful clause? What can you see as the problems with a clause like that? Definition of good faith, absolutely. Um, absolutely, the so one person's good faith and somebody else's good faith might be different. Uh, there is actually, again, a lot of jurisprudential angst going into the question of good faith in modern Australian contract law. Uh, in the first couple of uh, chapters of your textbook, the reading actually for our very first week, you would have come across Professor Finn's work um, and his arguments that there is an overriding duty of good faith in Australian contracting, that entering, there is a requirement to act in good faith in contracts and you can be in breach of a contract if you are not acting in good faith, whatever that actually means. I am probably a little bit more on the other side that I, I'm not entirely sure that that's actually going to fall out. Sorry, I can't remember your name again. Jackie. Ah, oh, I did remember your name. We've been... Oh, anyway, Jackie. So what were you about to say? I'm going to come close to you so hopefully the... Mm -hmm. So, so I'm not sure, Jill, Jackie has a lovely voice but it's very quiet. Uh, so she's saying that in an in industrial relations context you hear the words good faith quite a lot and you're absolutely right, there is legislation and industrial awards that use the word good faith. Good faith in an industrial context has been judicially interpreted um, and those, so again, little research hint for some of you. When you come across words like negotiation, good faith, even mediation, even words like consideration or I'm sure all sorts of words that might have a legal context, one of the great place to start to understand them is to look in one of the dictionaries of words and phrases judicially considered. So actually look and see whether a court has determined what those words mean. 
Um, and then, going backwards from there, you can look at the cases in which those words were judicially considered and come to a view as to whether the circumstances that you're looking at overlap with. So there is quite a lot of determination about what good faith means in an industrial relations context. But an industrial relations context is different from a contracting contract. If we, if we remember the underlying assumption that sits behind contract law is we've got, and it's a ridiculous assumption, I will give you this, but there is this presumption that we have parties, <laughs> let's face it, that we've got blokes with equal amounts of bargaining power who have entered into an arrangement and that they can commercially look after themselves and they can agree to a stupid deal if they want to. The reality of the world is there are, there's, you never have equal bargaining power. You never have equal bargaining power. You might have even really similar amounts of bargaining power, but you never have equal bargaining power. There is always somebody who wants the deal more than the other one. Somebody who is closer to walking away than the other person or the other party. And particularly when we're talking about commercial arrangements, when we're not even dealing with people, we're dealing with very large corporations through their managers, their senior managers, their directors or otherwise. So good faith in a industrial situation, you're talking about an employer and employee. So in fact, most of the good faith determination, and I'm not an employment or an industrial relations lawyer by any stretch of the imagination, but as I understand it, most of the consideration has been whether an employer is acting in good faith or whether a union is acting in good faith. It's been very difficult for anybody to establish that an employee has an obligation to act in good faith, whatever that means beyond comply with the law and the terms of their employment contract. And I think most of us understand good faith to mean something more than just mere compliance. But um, again, bombard me with the cases if I've got that wrong, because I would be interested actually. So again, we can have this idea with these, these statements, they can be vague, we can make sense of them. The question becomes at what point are they so vague as to be uncertain? And the answer in short form is that will depend on the context. So we have seen um, uh, agreements to negotiate as being binding. Whether or not to bring good faith into that is a different thing, but we have seen contracts that have been upheld where a party has been required to go into the negotiation. But an agreement to agree something will never be binding because an agreement to agree lacks certainty and it also lacks consideration when you think about it. If I agree to do something in the future and we don't know what that future thing is, then there's a risk of an illusory promise there. There's a risk of no consideration. So when we think about options, for example, that feels like an agreement to agree something in the future, but it's actually not. It's an offer that's being held open, that the promise to hold it open for a period of time has been given for consideration. The intention is that it's a binding promise, the promise to hold the offer open for a period of time and the terms are usually certain too. So if we use, for example, an option to, uh, that's given in relation to leased premises, so I am leasing the premises for three years and I have two successive options to renew the lease. The terms are known, we've got an existing lease. The rent is likely to have a formula. It'll either be the current rent adjusted by reference to some formula that is quite certain. The parties are known. It is quite usual for an option to only be exercisable by the person to whom it is granted, that there will be a prohibition against that option being assigned 
without the consent of the landlord. Just as if you rent the property, you can't just then sublease it to somebody else without the landlord's permi permission. So we know what all of those things are. It's not an agreement to agree in the future. It is a future right that can be exercised and the right itself is being contractually held open. Negotiating good faith also has been held to be um, an enforceable arrangement, provided again that the promise itself is sufficiently clear. And in that context, we could understand what good faith meant. And in fact, here it is, it's yet another um, industrial relations uh, context. Questions, concerns, frustrations? Not going quite fast enough, but let's keep going. William. Um, reasonable and best endeavours clauses, are they mm. usually brought up in the certainty? So the often we will see terms that talk about somebody needing to be reasonable or to use their best endeavours to do something. It's more a question around interpreting what those terms mean. Um, the question becomes if you've got so if I have a right, for example, I've promised to sell you something or to deliver it based on my best endeavours um, and I've got a discretion that I can act, exercise reasonably to withdraw at any point in time, but you have to pay me up front. Question would be, is that an illusory promise because I can walk away from it any time my best in But the, in that case, the addition of words like best endeavours and that I can only pull out if it's reasonable for me to do so might be the thing that stop it from being an illusory promise because I would need to demonstrate that my withdrawing from the agreement was um, So let me try and think of an example. Let's say I take up dog breeding and I promise to sell you the next black male puppy that I have in a litter and that I will use my best endeavours to have a puppy to you in the next 12 months. Um, and, but at the end of the day, I can pull out, oh, you're gonna pay me a deposit now, and I can pull out of the agreement but keep the deposit because I'm using it to pay, my, pay for my mummy dog, uh, dog food, um, as long as I act reasonably in doing so. And it just turns out that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good ethical dog breeder. I only let my, and you know this in advance, and my dogs only have one litter a year. And I have, you know, we go through our, what did I say, two year period or whatever it is. We have two litters and I just don't have a black dog. Like it's actually, it's reasonable. I can take photographs of the puppies and it's just like, I just can't deliver, yeah, right? Yep. It's, and that was a risk that you knew about. That's not an illusory promise. But uh, if I say um, I will, you know, you're going to get me a coffee during the break and I'll give you an HD, but I'm reserving the rights to uh, decline that um, or, or pull out of that at any moment, reasonably or not, thinking that's more likely to be an illusory promise because, you know, well, I'm not saying it's not going to happen, William, it might, but like it's going to have nothing to do with whether or not you bring me a coffee. So, um, so oh, actually, let's just keep going here. The next thing I want to talk about is that the terms themselves, we need to understand what they mean. Okay, so we've talked about that we need to reach agreement on all the essential things, but we also need to understand what the terms mean. So here we're really asking the question, are the terms clear and unambiguous? Sounds straightforward. This is usually the hardest thing to do in real life. This is where the craft of drafting legal agreements comes into effect. So agreed terms need to be sufficiently certain and clear so that the parties can understand the rights that they have and the obligations that they have and that the courts can enforce those rights or obligations. In order for a court to make somebody do something or to give somebody the benefit of some right, they need to understand what that obligation is or what that right is. Courts don't usually take a narrow approach and they'll attribute a meaning to language used by the parties 
unless it's impossible to do so. Again, going back to that maxim that I gave you right at the beginning, if there's a way of reading the contract so it makes sense, the courts are going to try and do that. So we need to be able to look at the language that's used here. Courts will ask, is that language so obscure and so incapable of any definite or precise meaning that a court is unable to attribute to the parties any particular contractual intention? So look at this, here certainty is overlapping with intention again. Do we really know what we mean? Um, in Upper Hunter County District and Australian Chilling and Freezing Company, um, it's really interesting, a lot of um, cases that go to certainty involve the supply of electricity. I just find this a really interesting thing that many, many cases in this space, they all involve the supply of electricity. Um, so Chief Justice Barwick said, the terms may ultimately and logically be worked out, if not by the parties, then by the courts. So that is the test. Can we logically work out what is meant? But interpreting isn't always easy. So, timber used in a building house must be of high quality. Looks straightforward, but high quality, does that mean that I need to be using luthier, standard mahogany and rosewood in the building of the house? There's no doubt that that is high quality timber. Does it mean I need to be using marine ply? Does it mean that I have to be using ethically sourced timbers? What does high quality mean? Again, logical context will help. Eggs supplied must be fresh, given our discussion with Egg Boy recently. That could have all sorts of different reasons. The rent payable must be set at a reasonable price. Reasonable to who? Reasonable to the landlord, reasonable to the tenant reasonable, what does that mean in that context? Upper Hunter Council, so in this case, um, the council agreed to supply electricity to the chilling and freezing company. Clause five of the agreement said, it's agreed that during the term of the agreement, if the supplier's cost shall vary in other respects than has been herein provided, which is a very roundabout way of saying that if during the term of the agreement, the electricity supplier's costs change in a way that hasn't already been discussed in the agreement, then the electricity supplier will have the right to change the maximum charge or the charges by giving a notice to the purchaser. The council wanted to increase the charges and the company argued that Clause 5 was void for uncertainty. So what do we think? Some of you will have read it. I went to get water and I didn't get it. Can I be really rude and ask... You've been nice to me before. <laughs> Half a glass of water. Thank you. What do we think? Is that, um, is that reasonable? Unreasonable? Does it make sense? Costs gone up. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Everybody's quiet today. It's not very specific, is it? Um, so we've already got, I mean, you're not getting the whole contract here. I'm being kind to you. But I think you've probably worked out that there are other bits of the agreement that are already saying, well, if our costs let's assume, the costs of our us getting the power from somewhere else, because let's face it, most councils don't generate their own power, right? They're buying power from the grid somewhere else. If the power costs go up, uh, our power costs go up, then we're going to charge you. Presumably there are other costs, you know, the general things like the cost of the poles or the wiring or the maintenance people or whatever, some things that they can see what they are and they will have built them in. But also they're, they're taking a margin between what their cost is and something else. These contracts are very specific. And then we've got that, but if there's something else, 
and it, tend, it also it doesn't use the word go up or go down, it just says vary if they change. So if this changes, then we can change these prices. So it's really good, like well written contracts. It should never progress, should it? Um, if you've got a well written contract, it should never progress, and that I hope is why they will continue to pay you the big bucks when I retire. Um, but unfortunately, well, I, I don't think this is a particularly well written clause myself. Um, I mean, I look at it and I think, well these costs could go down and that would give you the right to put these costs up. Like that's actually not an inconsistent reading of the, those words, is it? Is that what they really agreed? I don't know, I'm, I'm being devil's advocate here. Chief Ju Justice Barwick said, so long as the language employed by the parties is not so obscure and so incapable of any definite or precise meaning that the court is unable to attribute to the parties any particular contractual intention, the contract cannot be void or uncertain or meaningless. So he said, yeah, it's a badly written clause, but we can actually make sense of it. No narrow or pedantic approach is warranted, particularly in the case of a commercial arrangement. So actually being able to get out of a price change just because it's a badly worded clause, the court's not going, the court can make a sensible reading of it. You know, and I'm there going, I mean, I know I'm just two seconds ago saying, well, I don't like this clause because, you know, very, it's not saying go up, very here is not saying go up either. I can see a logical reason where you could raise that argument. But in this context, that's not the argument they were raising. They were saying our other general costs have gone up. The costs aren't caught in this other place. We need to put our costs up. Hunter Chilling and Freezing Company is saying, hang on a minute, we paid a lot of money to negotiate this agreement at the very beginning. You know, and I mean, you can tell by their name what they do, right? It's pretty devastating to a freezing and chilling business to lose access to power. So it's something that they need to negotiate and really understand what they want. They need to have backup supply. They, you know, it's not like just going and getting a standard contract. So again, Barwick's saying, well, this is a commercial arrangement. So it's not so ambiguous or so devoid of meaning that we can't make sense of it. We can come up with a meaningful understanding of this clause. We're not going to knock a contract out for the sake of it. Again, going back to that maximum in the beginning, if we can find a way to see a contract, then we would rather enforce a contract, even though it's not perfect, than make something void and uncertain, particularly when the parties are uh, making, um, yeah, it's a commercial arrangement, and there's, particularly when there's a relative equality. So there's no uncertainty or ambiguity in the expression supplier's costs. However wide might be the area of possible agreement or disagreement as to what might be included, at the end of the day, the supplier's costs are the supplier's costs. They've got to account, they know what their costs are. And again, story back to us, those of us who are lovers rather than fighters, who want to be involved in the writing of agreements, the more precise we are here, the less likely we are to have these. So the fight really should have been earlier on. It's like, actually, no, you've got all of these other places to tell us where your costs might go up. And we'll put that into the equation. But just general supply costs, we're not going to wear that. That's your risk, not ours. Because you're the ones who are in a position to be efficient or inefficient in your costing. Sorry, Jackie. Well, that looks like a just-in-case type clause, yes. Um, again, contracts are private laws. So they're, the parties themselves are negotiating and agreeing what the rules of their game are going to be. And they don't necessarily get a statutory protection. Now, consumer contracts, we then have the Australian consumer laws sit over the top and say in certain circumstances, actually, it has to be fair. There's nothing that says, I mean, this is not a consumer contract. We have got an industrial chilling and freezing company dealing with a council for the supply of electricity. It is not, a, and it's a bespoke electricity contract. It's not me buying 
electricity for my house from a local supplier. Uh, so it's a negotiated arrangement. But where I'm, I'm buying based on a standard term. Reasonableness. Um, it can be really, really difficult to, um, to determine. In fact, it can be unreasonably difficult to determine what's reasonable. Um, a standard of reasonableness is often used to provide completeness or certainty, where certainty might otherwise be lack, lacking. So, okay, you've got to pay a reasonable price for the goods. All these things will make sense, a fair and equitable price for services, a price at fair market value. If you've got a market by which you compare, can compare, if you can determine what reasonable looks like, so for example, the consumer price index is a reasonable index. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> I've been trying to avoid coughing in the microphone for so long. Um, so if you've got a basis for comparing, it can be reasonable. But like Whitlock and Brew, where you don't have that basis, uh, less so. So judges themselves won't always agree on what is or isn't reasonable either. So what does that mean for us drafting contracts? Um, reasonableness becomes a last resort where possible that we want to actually put in a formula. We want to have some basis for working out what that is. Best endeavours, reasonable, you see them all the time, but they are lazy to an extent. And if you can find a way to be precise, you are more likely to end up with a good result. Of course, the downside is, is at the point that people are negotiating contracts, they're all mates, right? They're all, they want the deal to go ahead. They, you know, they don't want, to look like they're going to be a difficult customer or a difficult supplier, etc. So it can be actually quite difficult to get your clients to understand the benefits, which is one of the reasons we lawyers get such a bad name from time to time. I was recently called part of the department for saying no. You'll hear it all. You'll get used to it. Terms need not, must not be illusory. And I am going to try and get through this really quickly because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Okay, so what do we mean by illusory here? If a party is given an unfettered discretion, then we end up with no promise made at all. So it's like, you know, I promise I will do this unless or but. Um, I promise to do it, but you won't have any remedy against me if I don't. So, place of development, clause 14 said, the Commonwealth will pay to the timber company a subsidy on the exportation of products from the territory of an amount or at a rate determined by the Commonwealth from time to time, but the subsidy shall not exceed the amount of customs duty paid. Okay, we, we might, oh, actually it says we will pay you something and the amount will be whatever amount we decide at the time, that it won't be more than this. Justice Keto said that the general principle is wherever words by which themselves constitute a promise are accompanied by words showing that the promisor is to have a discretion or an option, the result is there is no contract. However, if a party is given a latitude of choice which does not amount to a complete and unfettered discretion, so there is some fettering on the discretion itself, or the discretion relates to the fulfilment of a condition on which performance might depend, or the discretion is exercised by a third party, we still might have a promise. We're likely to have a promise. So Meehan and Jones is a good example for that. Here we have the contract for the sale of land, which was subject to the purchaser receiving approval for finance on satisfactory terms and conditions in an amount sufficient to complete the purchase. Okay, so the discretion here is for the purchaser, the purchaser has to get finance, 
The contract says on satisfactory terms. It doesn't say satisfactory to the purchaser, doesn't say satisfactory to the vendor. I think it kind of makes sense if the purchaser is the one borrowing the money that it would be satisfactory to the purchaser. But what happened in that particular case is that the vendor decided to pull out. And the vendor is saying, well, this is, it's an unfettered discretion. So there's no certainty in the contract. I didn't know what the situation was going to be. I had no certainty, so I should be able to pull out of the deal. So me and it advised Jones on the 30th of July that A and B had been satisfied, but Jones, the vendor, had entered into another agreement to sell the land to a third party. Jones argued that the me and contract was unenforceable for lack of certainty. Unsurprisingly, the, well, it did go to the High Court, so there clearly there were some arguments along the way, but unsurprisingly, the High Court held, well, actually, it was, it, clearly it meant satisfactory to the purchaser. There was no other reason, there's no reason for the vendor to care one way or the other. And the purchaser was required to act honestly and reasonably in deciding whether finance was satisfactory they didn't have an unfettered discretion. Here, because the court was able to assess the purchaser's fulfilment of the standards of honesty and reasonableness, the purchaser's obligation was enforceable, therefore there was a contract, therefore the vendor was in breach by selling that land to somebody else before the period had expired for the purchaser to complete the contract. Again, typical kind of case in this, uh, in this subject where where the issue's only in dispute because one of the parties didn't want there to be a contract anymore. Go to Key and Cohen. We had an offer to purchase land where a clause provided that the purchasers would, if required by the vendor, sign a further agreement that was going to be prepared by the vendor's solicitors containing the terms that they'd already agreed and such other covenants and conditions as they may reasonably require. So in that particular case, it was held that this agreement was binding, that it wasn't an unfettered discretion by the vendor. In fact, what the vendor had, the discretion was in the hands of a third party, the vendor's solicitors. Clause didn't require further agreement. Instead, it allowed the vendor's solicitor to add some additional terms, but that it's the vendor's solicitor that had that right to do it. No, it was a third party. By the way, you can fail this test in any of the three ways that are available. It can be illusory, unclear and incomplete all at the same time. You only have to fail it once for the contract to be void. But just because if you if just because it is if it's not illusory, that's not enough. You have to check that it's not illusory, that it is complete and that it's not uncertain. So, they're, but they're not mutually exclusive arguments to pull the case down. How are we doing? It is a quarter past. I'm just going to race a little bit here. Biotech and Pace um, is a good case to have a look at. That's the one that involves, um, I think he was Professor Pace or Dr. Pace. He was a biotechnologist. He got wooed away from whatever tedious laboratory job he had at a university to come and work with a startup and they made him some general promises. The promises include that he would be uh, get the benefit of an option scheme. Um, at the time that he joined the company, they didn't have an option scheme in place yet. It wasn't clear what that was going to look like. He joined the company, he worked for a couple of years, they still didn't have an option scheme, they sacked him. He then went and said, I would like my share of equity in the company, please. And ultimately they had a look at it and they said, well, actually, yes, the, there is a tension here. The courts do want to uphold contracts, not to frustrate them. However, courts won't uh, uphold unaccepted, unacceptably ambiguous or uncertain terms and we will not make up terms when the parties haven't worked out what the terms are themselves. So, uh, so 
This judgment is good in relation to certainty because, once again, in his very clear style, Justice Kirby tells us both what the court will do and what the court won't do. Um, and it, the court will not spell out that which the parties themselves haven't agreed. It will, the courts will not clarify something that is irredeemably obscure. And the courts will not take up a discretion that the parties themselves have agreed is reserved to one party or another. In that particular case, oh, OK, they will do these things, sorry. I keep expecting to come to the conclusion. Uh, they will pay a, a regard to the features of the agreement, the relationship that the parties had with each other, and some external relevant references. So when we think about Whitlock and Blue, Brew, they couldn't find an agreement because there was no relevant external reference point. But then in the Hunter Valley case, they could see a reasonable way of reading the terms. In, in this particular case, there was just going to be an option agreement. There was no basis on working out uh, for working out what the terms of that option agreement would be, whether Professor Pace was going to need to pay for his equity, if so, at what price, what proportion of the company would he own, how much of the company would be reserved to employees, a range of things that just had never been discussed or agreed. So Kirby came up with this two-part test. Firstly, is the promise so devoid of meaning and so dependent upon the promisor as to be illusory? And then secondly, was the promise so uncertain in content that it cannot be enforced even as elaborated by admissible extrinsic evidence. So we need to look at both sides. And in that particular case, he said, well, in relation to the first part, the term itself was illusory because the terms relating to the equity sharing scheme depended on the decision of one party, the company. They hadn't worked out what this scheme was going to look like. And there was absolutely no external standard that you could look at. Then in relation to the second part of the test, the term was void for uncertainty because there were too many elements that were uncertain. Number of shares, the classes, the terms, the price, the terms of the acquisition, um, how long you could hold them for, the basis on which you could sell them, any of those things. So again, each case will depend on its own facts. I'm not going to add anything here that I haven't already said. Do you need to stretch your legs or can I go for five minutes more to just get this all done in one go? You're just looking at me happily enough or you haven't walked out. Um, so what happens next? Basically, what we need to do is think about these two things. Is the inconsistency, the uncertainty from one of those three such that we can take it out? And if it's, if it's gone, does the contract stand up by itself? And secondly, is the term for the benefit of one party who can actually say, OK, I can I waive my rights under that term so the contract can continue. So we need to understand a bit of language here. What happens if the agreement is void? So that means if the contract itself is void for uncertainty, none of the agreement can be enforced. It is so uncertain, so incomplete in that particular case of Whitlock and Brew, um, we're missing an essential term. We just, it's void for uncertainty. We cannot continue at all. However, if it was just one provision, if we could just take that provision out and ask ourselves, can the rest of the contract survive without it? Um, and a good example here is Fitzgerald and Masters, which is in your textbook. Um, there's a valid contract, but it, we ha it has an ineffective term. If we can sever out that ineffective term, the rest of the contract can survive. And then lastly, could the term, the offending term itself be waived? Can the contract again be severed out as a consequence of the waiver? Uh, again, go back to your textbook. A good example here is uh, go to... Oh, I've got the cases around the right way. Go to Ken Kerwin is the one we just talked about five minutes ago. The one where the Ben, or no, me and Jones, sorry, me and Jones, where uh, the purchaser had effectively the right or, or the benefit of the uh, finance condition. 
the court found that clearly the beneficiary of that finance condition was the purchaser. Say the purchaser could only get, uh, borrow money at 25%. It might be perfectly reasonable for them to say, okay, I'm gonna pull out of this contract because that's an unreasonable usurious rate of interest. But they could also waive that provision. They could say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna waive my right. I'm going to take on unreasonable finance to get this deal over the line and then I'll refinance later. So again, it is a possibility. Um, factors that lead to the conclusion that the whole contract is void largely goes to incompleteness. Is there an essential term that's missing? Because if it's an essential term, then we also, it goes to intention, it goes to the very nature of the offer itself, the nature of the agreement, um, and can it even go to consideration. So if an essential term has been admitted and the court is unwilling to supply a replacement term, the contract is commercially unworkable, it's really going to be difficult to do anything other than find that it's void. If it can be inferred that the party's intention was that there would be an agreement without the term, it won't be. Or, sorry, if it can be inferred that the party's intention was that there would be no agreement without the term, then it will be void. If the intention can be inferred the other way, so the courts will look at what the parties have done. So it's very hard to find that an agreement is void for uncertainty if one party has wholly or partly performed their side of the bargain. When can you sever a term if it's not an essential term? Um, if you can understand that the parties expected that the agreement would go ahead without that. We were negotiating about who would take on the responsibility for insurance in the time between the deal being signed and the goods being handed over. We never reached agreement so we left it out we can infer from that that the parties expected that they would be able to continue without that term.